Welcome everyone to the fifth and final panel of the Confronting the Climate Crisis, Feminist Pathways to Just and Sustainable Futures. My name is Claire Duncanson. If you've joined us for previous panels, you'll have seen me already, but I'm Senior Lecturer in International Relations at the University of Edinburgh and partner in the Consortium's Feminist Roadmap for Sustainable Peace project. So I will be uh, moderating this panel on Feminist Pathways to Just and Sustainable Futures, part two. It continues the conversation um, that we just had earlier, um, which was also on feminist, just and sustainable futures, which in turn follows on from the panels we've had over the previous two days, um, which, which considers the range of feminist approaches to the climate crisis and the flaws in some of the mainstream uh, responses to the climate crisis. So one of the themes um, that we had earlier was um, on the range of strategies that feminists can um, adopt to bring about just and sustainable futures and, and whether those strategies are always complementary or, or sometimes clashing. So I'm looking forward to hearing this panel's views on that and other thorny issues which may emerge. So we're going to hear from five wonderful speakers who will each speak for about 10 minutes, um, well, for 10 minutes, and then we'll spend about 20 minutes in a panel discussion. After that, we'll turn to questions from the audience. Um, so please do use the Q&A feature on the Zoom to submit your questions for the panel. At the end of the session, we'd be really grateful if you would take a few minutes to fill out our post-event survey, which will pop up on your screen as soon as you exit the webinar. Okay, so um, first um, speaker that we have up today is uh, Lindsay Bassigal. Lindsay Bassigal is of Chicksaw, Polish and Irish descent. She was born and raised in Michigan but now lives in Algonquin Territory in Ottawa, Ontario. Lindsay comes from a working class family, was not raised around activism, so her activist journey didn't begin until her secondary education. Attending a primarily white Catholic, institu Catholic institution presented itself with many opportunities to work against conservative values. And through this, Lindsay became an outspoken advocate for the rights of <coughs> excuse me, structurally oppressed groups. Following her graduation, Lindsay then earned a master's in gender, globalization and rights from the University of Ireland, Galway. Her final thesis explored the intersections between gender-based environmental violence, indigenous women, colonialism and human rights. Lindsay then moved to so-called Canada, beginning work as the communications coordinator at the Panktuit Inuit Women of Canada and becoming heavily involved with the climate justice movement. She's now communications director at Indigenous Climate so over to you, Lindsay. Thank you. I'm just going to go ahead and pull up my screen share really quick here. There we go. So, Chukma, Sohochi Fuat, Lindsay, Chikasha Seya. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be able to meet with all of you virtually. So my name is Lindsay Boskell. I am an Indigenous queer woman um, of Chickasaw, Irish and Polish background. Um, as was mentioned, I'm originally from Michigan, but I've lived up here in so-called Canada for about two and a half years now. Um, and I am the communications director at Indigenous Climate Action, which is the only Indigenous led climate justice organization in so-called Canada. And so today I just want to speak to healing and resistance by Indigenous women against climate change and environmental degradation. But I also want to begin with a little bit of framing first. So to begin, I just want to talk about the idea of environmental violence, which I'm sure many folks here are already aware of. So it can come about from a few different places. We think of things like pesticides and persistent organic pollutants and chemicals produced by the extractive industries, such as the tar sands um, and coal and oil industries as well. We're thinking of military installations and weapons testing, waste dumping and incineration, industrial processes, and then also all phases of uranium mining, milling, and waste storage as well. So environmental violence does not affect only indigenous peoples, uh, but there is a lot of environmental violence that occurs on our lands and in and around our communities and nations as well. 
And so because of its close proximity to us, it can have a multitude of harmful effects. This is a, a very long list of some of the effects of environmental violence on Indigenous communities, but I think it's also important to say them out loud just to really recognize as to how devastating environmental violence is to our peoples. So some of these effects include reproductive health issues such as birth defects and infertility, cancer and other illnesses, chronic social stressors like sexual, domestic and family violence, missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit folks or MMIWG2S, human trafficking for both labor and sexual exploitation, HIV and other sexually transmitted infections, increased crime in communities, increased rates of incarceration, increased drug and alcohol use in communities, and still continuing on, alcohol-related traffic fatalities, suicide, particularly among young people in our communities, land trauma and dispossession, loss of culture and self-determination, divisions in families and communities, child removal, mental health concerns, and poverty. So that's a very long list. Um, and it also illustrates the connections between the health and safety of the lands and waters and the health and safety of indigenous bodies on all fronts. So not just physically, but also thinking of mental effects, emotional effects, and spiritual effects as well. So when resources are taken from our lands, it leads to a contamination of the environment and also damages our ecosystems, which affects our traditional ways of life. And this extraction also increases greenhouse gas emissions, which worsen climate change, as we know, and creates really just this devastating cycle. And so the sad irony is that Indigenous peoples are among those least responsible for environmental degradation, but are subjected to its negative effects, as shown in the long list of effects of environmental violence. And you'll also notice that many of these affect Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit people, and genderqueer folks particularly. So Indigenous women often hold traditional roles uh, that require intimate connection to the lands and waters. So we often grow food and prepare it, we pick medicines, we teach our traditional ways of being out on the land, and we also carry the next generation. But as we know, when people lose value for the land, they also lose value for the women. And so one of the most apparent examples of this is in the extractive industry, which has proven to be incredibly harmful to indigenous women, girls, two-spirit folks, and genderqueer folks as well. So you might have heard of man camps, and man camps are large numbers of men introduced into indigenous territories for work in drilling or mining. And they're often correlated to increases in sexual and domestic violence, increased usage of drugs and alcohol, trafficking and prostitution and murders or disappearances, which contributes to the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit folks in both Canada and the United States. So not only do extractive industries affect women's safety, but these projects can also impact indigenous women's reproductive systems through exposure to toxins. So this can in turn affect indigenous children due to the storage of toxins within fat, which leads to the potential exposure to fetuses and to newborns as well. Ultimately, these effects are rooted in colonialism. So when the land is destroyed, the carriers of the next generation are also destroyed and therefore our people are destroyed, which allows for access to our lands. And it's only through this elimination that the structures of settler colonialism and capitalism can take over our lands. So really it's the ultimate expression of the patriarchal disregard for women and the colonial disregard for nature. However, Indigenous women have been resisting since the beginning of the colonial project, and we still are. Our struggles are rooted in the community and future generations and for ancestral struggles for land and livelihood. It is a feminist resistance that is anti-capitalist and anti-imperial and demands respect and protection not only for our bodies, but also for the lands, waters, Mother Earth, cultures, and communities. And so I just want to showcase three examples of Indigenous women's resistance of, among the many <laughs> that exist. So this is a group called Tiny House Warriors. They're a frontline group who have built tiny houses along the Trans Mountain Pipeline route to assert sequipemic law and jurisdiction, and they also block access to the TMX route. So every day they're fighting against MMIWG and they're fighting for Indigenous sovereignty, all while experiencing consistent threats of violence and actual violence from settlers in the area. 
Uh, they're consistently having folks coming onto their lands, uh, particularly white folks working uh, in the man camps and also along the pipeline routes uh, that come in and make threats of violence. There was also one of their camps that was actually burned down within the past few months as well by settlers. There are also various indigenous communities and organizations working against the tar sands. And so if you haven't heard of the tar sands, they're massive deposits of crude oil that are found in Alberta, which is then sent to refineries for processing. It's a very destructive process, which affects indigenous communities heavily because it primarily happens on our lands. But there is continued resistance against the tar sands led by indigenous women. So my organization, Indigenous Climate Action, was actually founded by some of these activists, um, Melina Labukan Massimo, Ariel De Equi Derange, Jesse Cardinal, and Crystal Lehman. And Melina actually started a solar company as well called Sacred Earth Solar uh, to increase her community's sovereignty and to move them off the grid. Um, and now works to solarize other frontline efforts, including the aforementioned Tiny House Warriors and also the Wet Sowodin who are fighting for their sovereignty as well. Finally, I want to uplift the work of Treaty Truck House slash the Grassroots Grandmother Circle. So this group is led by Mi'kmaq women who are opposing Alton Gas, um, who is developing a huge storage site for hydrocarbons such as natural gas. This will destroy the Shubakanady River in Nova Scotia, which is an important fishing site for the Mi'kmaq and home to several endangered and at-risk species. The proposed discharge site is also one of the last breeding grounds for striped bass and habitat for the endangered Atlantic salmon. The truck house has been operating for a few years now uh, and they're continuing to fight for treaty rights and for Mi'kmaq self-determination. So these are just three examples of indigenous women leading resistance against extractive industries, but there are so many more. Uh, and it's not only resisting that we're doing, but we're also providing solutions, not only with alternatives to extractive industries, but also just to climate change in general. So these are some of the solutions. Um, you'll notice that they're mostly all small and community or regionally focused. Uh, they use traditional knowledge or blends of traditional and mainstream knowledge. And perhaps most importantly, they're not market-based mechanisms like carbon pricing uh, that rely on capitalism in order to function. So rather they include things like energy independence, like microgrids for solar energy, wind farms and small scale hydro through run of the river, uh, food and water independence by opposing commercial fishing farms, which infringe on indigenous rights, hunting, harvesting our traditional foods and medicines and rainwater harvesting. It also means land use knowledge like controlled burning, which has gotten a lot of attention lately with the wildfires out west and the protection of biodiversity, which is sometimes an overlooked aspect, but also so important. And so really, I guess just in essence, these are solutions that are hope for the future. Um, we know that climate change is happening and it's happening fast, but the solutions are there as we can see here. The resistance is there and it's being led by BIPOC women and genderqueer folks all over the world. And the healing is there, but we can only heal ourselves if we heal the land too. So thank you very much to everyone, Yakuke, and that's my time. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, wonderful and wonderfully kept to time as well. Um, next up, we have Bridget Burns. Um, Bridget is a feminist and environmental activist specialising in policy advocacy, research and movement building um, at the intersections of gender equality, women's rights and climate justice. For over a decade, she's worked to integrate gender equality into the decisions and outcomes of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. In her work at the international policy level, she's facilitated travel support and capacity building for over 300 women from the Global South to participate as part of national delegations. Um, in addition, Bridget serves as the co-focal point of the Women and Gender Constituency, which supports the political participation of women's rights advocates into the climate process. Through synergies with key civil society activists, this work has supported the integration of gender equality language across 70 programmes and decisions of the UNFCCC. In 2019, Bridget helped kickstart a collective of feminist organisations and activists working to develop a feminist analysis of the Green New Deal in the United States. Bridget holds a Master's in Gender Development and Globalization from the London School of Economics and Political Science. So over to you, Bridget. 
Thank you so much, Claire. Um, just before I get started, I'm, I'm unfortunately having some trouble um, sharing for some reason. Um, and I had just shared in, in the chat window with my other colleagues a link to um, my presentation. And I wondered if someone might be able to pull it up for me. Melissa, is that something you can do? I also pull it up since I just screen shared last. I have it. Uh, Lindsay, thank Wonderful. You. Lindsay, thank you so, so well, much. Yep, just let me know when you want to move it. Yes, it's just a, a kind of a background, so hopefully it won't be too much. Um, thank you again. Good afternoon, y'all. Um, my name is Bridget Burns. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm uh, based out of the unceded Lenape lands or so-called Brooklyn. Um, and I'm the director of WeDo, the Women's Environment and Development Organization, which is a 35-year-old global advocacy organization working at the intersections of gender and environmental justice. And it's really a distinct honor to be part of this symposium alongside so many mentors, allies, and friends today. So I've had the privilege of being on a number of the other uh, panels that have been over the last few days. And I think that this has really served to showcase the deep breath of work happening at the intersections of gender equality, human rights, sustainable development and climate justice. Um, the work and the feminist epistemologies that for decades has been clear on the inextricable links between colonialism, white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy, and that have together created an ecosystem of responses to try to dismantle these isms, researching, collecting data, doing the work of mainstreaming into policy spaces, while also doing the critical work of movement building and being in resistance. And I really, really honor and lift up, Lindsay, the examples that you showed before, because I think this is the resistance grounded in all of the analysis and the work that we, that we do together. Um, a truly feminist analysis of our current multiple crises cannot be divorced from the deeply structural uh, and intersecting understanding of how power is created and concentrated. And therefore, the work we are doing to not only build a just and healthy feminist future, but to articulate a pathway of how to get there is no small task. My brilliant friend and ally, Noeline Nabulivu from Fiji, uh, who works for an organization called Diva, consistently reminds us that we don't have time as feminists for small work. What we need is big work. And big, I take to mean deep structural intersectional work. So we do, uh, the Women's Environment Development Organization is an advocacy org. We, um, the pillars of how we think about this work are deeply rooted in in history, we've had a lot of conversations about the importance of understanding the history of where this is coming from, as well as thinking about the future, um, being very committed to imagining and visibilizing what is a just feminist future, what does that look like, um, and being ferocious in understanding and mapping and analyzing the levers for change we need to grasp to get there. Um, so in early 2019, as the national momentum picked up uh, a rallying cry for a Green New Deal here in the United States, we do and many other activists, my colleague Diana as well, uh, who's also on this call, um, saw a key opportunity in charting, a critical entry point for charting this path. And for us, the context of a New Deal as a framing was first an opportunity in the positive, here we have a policy framework around climate change and environment that rather than what we've seen in many other spaces with a very laser focus on technology or emission reductions targets actually builds from a framework around social protection. And from the beginning, it frames how we want to enter into this policy conversation to tackle climate crisis in the structural. Uh, and the Green New Deal resolution itself is foregrounded on jobs, social welfare, universal health care and centering frontline communities. So I think this we saw as a potential entry point for bringing in feminist analysis um, and understanding that if the Green New Deal is not actively feminist and anti-racist, it both legitimizes and reinscribes the existing foundations and impacts of patriarchal white supremacist colonial policies that were present in the, green, in the New Deal itself um, that came before it, one which served to reinforce institutional racism and also by and large failed to address historic economic exclusion of women. 
So a starting point was to create coalition. Um, next slide, please. And because we understood feminist action to be collective action, um, and it would require a coalition of individuals and organizations working towards justice at the intersections of environmental crisis. And we know it touches all intersections. So migrant justice, racial justice, economic justice, disability justice, reproductive justice, and gender justice. And we started by defining a set of 10 principles. You can see here and you can find out more information at that feministgreennewdeal.com. Thank you so much. Um, to put this vision on paper and to articulate what a collective feminist analysis looks like. So that includes that a feminist Green New Deal requires intersectional gender analysis across, across all actions, that it ensures democratically controlled community-led solutions. And a lot of that has to, it speaks to the examples that Lindsay showed in terms of non-market-based solutions to what is quote unquote sometimes small scale, but what do we really mean by an energy transition? And I know other colleagues are gonna to speak to that today as well. Um, that rejects false and harmful responses to climate change that fail to address root causes and works to create regenerative economies that center systemic feminist alternatives. And with, within all of this, it recognizes that there's no such thing as domestic climate policy. That even in the context of a US Green New Deal, we must commit to global justice through diplomacy, international cooperation, and a reckoning that the US has been the world's largest historic carbon polluter, while those in the global south have suffered its worst impacts. And I think it's also important to say here again, what others in this symposium have said before, this is not a new vision or analysis. This is the future we have envisioned before, that indigenous peoples have envisioned for us for centuries, that grassroots feminists have been calling for. Nor is the idea of a Green New Deal new or grounded in countries that of the global north. Indeed, it's a historicized and in the social and ecological frameworks of movements around concepts around anti-extractivism and buen vivir. So if you could go to the last slide on this, um, I wanted to share a, a, a new reader that has just been put out in doing this work as said, not just grounding in who are we as a coalition thinking about this from a US context, but really what does this look like in a, from a global justice frame and in a global context as well. And I welcome you to visit this reader, which uh, lists out the frameworks of many of our partners from around the world, from the ideas of Buen, Buen Vivir to feminist fossil fuel free future, just transition. What does this look like in different regions and different countries? Um, I, I, started my timer, but it didn't go off. So I, I might be getting just to the end of my time. Claire, if you could just flag for me with your hand of if I'm done or if I have one more minute. Fine, you have a couple more minutes. Okay, fantastic. Um, so thinking about how we move from the 10 principles that I shared before to action, I think it's really critically important that I the hone in again on the fact that it's not just about creating the vision, it's also about charting the pathway of how to get there. So we don't consider these lofty utopian principles, but levers for change. The Feminist Green New Deal Coalition is intervening in policy spaces to chart policies that divest from systems of harm and invest into systems of care. Policies that center global justice. So what does that look like? My colleague Mara was looking at some of the proposals for national climate planning and thinking through you know, we have this problem of consistently focusing on construction and not care. So when we talk about how we transition, there's a real focus on what the infrastructure is going to look like um, from a very, you know, patriarchal framework of infrastructure, meaning the built environment alone, as opposed to the service and the care industry and the support that we need to invest in uh, health education and all forms of care work. What is a a climate care core look like, for example, uh, one centered around providing for the basic needs of all people and foregrounded in serving frontline communities. How do we foreground the rights of indigenous peoples and indigenous sovereignty and understanding that is a critical feminist issue? How do we provide a vision of social protection that is reliant on divestment from fossil fuels and the carceral state, heeding the leadership of the movement for black lives and grounding ourselves in anti-racist work. And then what are the policies we need to invest in to center global justice, demanding polluter pays principles, a fair share of climate finance from developed countries, demilitarization and opposing false solutions, 
such as nuclear, geoengineering, et cetera. The pathway to enacting system-wide change is in taking an uncompromised intersectional and feminist approach to advocacy and in analysis of the inadequacy of efforts so far to deliver gender equality and social justice because it is often delinked from systemic root causes, whether they're trade, corporate power, environmental destruction, or militarism. And so I'm going to close off here just with leaving, um, you know, honing in and building on all of the approaches and the ecosystems as I started with to how we dismantle these isms are critically important. And I think being in collective together and understanding that the work we do to pull these different levers of power uh, is all part of how we actually chart that path towards a just and sustainable future. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for my pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Bridget. Um, Okay, next up we have O. To address both environmental and social justice issues, O has made health and well-being her life's purpose. She's worked for over 30 years as a practitioner and educator um, in the areas of bodywork, self-care, social services and healthcare support. O is a founding member of Serenity Solar, a community solar collaborative committed to social justice and to bringing green jobs opportunities to North Philadelphia. She sits on the board of Philly Thrive, a Philadelphia-based environmental justice organization focused on improving the health and well-being of the city's residents and supporting a just transition to a cleaner, healthier future. A longtime Quaker, O is a member of Central Philadelphia Monthly Meeting and leads Love and Respect Transform, a ministry that focuses on deepening our understanding and experience of alternatives to social and environmental violence by exploring the transformative power of love. Over to you, O. You're still muted, O. If you can unmute. <laughs> there we go. Now, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay, sweet. Okay, now I'm going to practice screen sharing. So I feel both honored and grateful to be able to uh, participate in this conversation. In many ways, I feel like I'm representing those who are marginalized, uh, coming literally from the grassroots. My name is O. It is actually spelled dot O, and I'll share a little bit more about how I got my name at, through storytelling. I am a climate and social justice activist in the Philadelphia area. And what I'm hoping to um, share in this moment is the power of fertilization. It is life-giving. The ability to fertilize is the ability to provide the resources, the necessary resources that allow for life to happen. I've been committed to building a trans community collaboration, and I mean the word tra trans in every sense of its word. We have people moving in and out. How do you create relationship when everything is so transient? And I'm choosing to believe that it's imperative that we do enter and engage with our trance-like cons consciousness. We literally need to enter a trance state, a state where inspiration exists. Within that inspiration, it has the capacity to move us towards a climate of just us. What does it mean to actually interrupt the billions of years of competing against each other. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Professor, professor Giovanna De Chiro. The prof, um, she spoke earlier, and it is through her vision, commitment to collaboration, that I even have an opportunity to participate at this level. I speak of myself as a love activist. I choose to believe that we have truly underestimated the power of love. We have domesticated love. A large part of that commitment is actually bringing our heart and our mind together as co-conspirators. How, do, how does our heart 
and our mind work together. Along with being an activist, a love activist, I'm also a storyteller. And you can probably see this by the way in which I'm presenting the materials. I'm an activist, as I shared, in the Philadelphia area. And it really is about bringing community together. But I mean community at every level. Often, I have felt very much like coming to a waterhole, a waterhole that actually has the capacity to facilitate life and bring sustenance. And also working with faculty, students, and community. Uh, this is diversity. We are not just speaking about humans. We are speaking about the four-legged. We are speaking about the winged and the insects. We are community. And so for me and those who I work with, this is about the ability to support and sustain transformation. The transformation that is so needed at this time for global healing. We are literally burning the planet down. Like literally, I wish, I wish that wasn't true, but we are. And so with that, I invite everybody to breathe. This is a time in which we really need to reclaim our birthright for breathing. And in the process of breathing, it is about reclaiming each other and embracing the earth. I am a queer woman. I am a queer woman who is committed to bringing life back into our hearts. And often I feel like we need defibrillators. We need defibrillators for our hearts to actually literally jump start our hearts again. What you probably don't know is that when you were um, developing in your mother's womb, the first functioning organ in the womb at, uh, when you were being developed is your heart. It's actually not your brain. It's your heart that is the first functioning organ. And I think that's pointing to something. I have focused on two specific climate justice organizations, Serenity Solar, which uh, Professor Giovanna DeCiro spoke about um, Serenity Solar and also Philly Thrive. Philly, Philly Thrive is a um, grassroots movement which I will speak about shortly. But let me start with um, Serenity Solar. Serenity Solar was created during a period of time in which I personally had been displaced. Um, homeless, brought into a parsonage through Cookman United Methodist Church, I started a women's support circle that began to flourish. And then spirit kind of knocked on my shoulder and said, hey, how about the men? Start a men's support group. And I was like, okay, what part of lesbian don't you understand? I know nothing about men, like nothing. But spirit kept knocking on my shoulder. No, start a men's support group. And because I'm faithful, I started a men's support group knowing nothing about men. However, in relationship with Giovanna, um, the men actually wanted to put a garden on the roof, but when Carr Everbach came out and did the engineer work, he found that actually the roof wouldn't hold the solar panel, I mean the uh, garden, and he said, but what we can do is we can put a solar panel. And so he came out into the community and he taught the men about solar, and lo and behold, we were able to create a solar business. Um, and here, um, as you saw, Kai, was instrumental in bringing um, solars into solar paneling into North Philadelphia. The other, other organization that I work with is Philly Thrive. Philly Thrive was a, is a grassroots movement that works across racial lines, economic lines, educational lines, gender lines. We just cross lines. That's what we do. We're line crossers. Um, in the process of doing that, again, more fire. Um, we were working at bringing down a 150 year old oil refinery through collaboration with a little support from Spirit. Um, Spirit kind of like blew up <laughs> the oil refinery, which gave us the leverage we needed to say, this place is really dangerous. And lo and behold, we were able to close a 150 year old oil refinery and New York Times then did a, a story on our work. So often I feel like this. And uh, actually I'm not the lioness. Usually I'm the gazelle. As a woman of color, as a queer woman of color, 
as a slow learning queer woman of color, I am often perceived as threat. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I am not, I am not a threat. I am so not a threat, but often I am perceived as such. Often I am in the run. I am actually a part of the solution. We are a part of the solution. So when I go into prayer and meditation and I attempt to figure out complex uh, f notions, I went into prayer and I said to Spirit, Spirit, what is a feminist based on the way in which I have been living my life? What I have found for me in being a feminist, it is about fertilizing. It's about bringing the necessary resources so that life can actually happen. And so this happens in engagement, the capacity to fertilize that which brings about life. We did already. Once upon a time, long, long ago, we were the seed of our mother. We call that egg. But we were also the seed of our father. We call that sperm. And this, this is actually where we learn the art of fertilizing, where we learn the art of engagement. We actually learned this process in the womb of our mother. This is our autobiography and it's an autobiography. It is the part of our life that we have misplaced and I choose to believe we have misplaced it because it happens within the jurisdiction of women. Fertilizing engagement, that's us. <laughs> this is how we incarnated. We incarnated as seeds in relationship this truly is a part of your autobiography, our autobiography. So fertilizing, that's the work I choose to believe as a feminist I'm up to. Fertilizing engagement, remembering our journey of where we have already come from. We must remember we've already done the impossible. We exist the ability to mature and to mature our integris, the integrity of who we are and the nuance of who we are. Each of us brings a nuance of life that needs to be matured and developed. We know how to do division in a way that actually facilitates life. We are truly amazing. I'm gonna invite everybody to breathe because I need to breathe. Um, <laughs> we are amazing transformational artists and it's time for us to treat ourselves and each other as if we truly are miracles. Fertilizing engagement, maturing integrity's nuance and inspiring. This is a culture that is deadening. It is depressing. It represses, suppresses, and depresses. It is imperative that we shift that paradigm from a depressing paradigm to one of inspiration. I get my inspiration from caterpillars. I love caterpillars. They are amazing, but they are teachers because they too know the place of fire. You have egg, you have caterpillar, you have chrysalis, and within the chrysalis, there is this destructive energy Destruction is a part of life in order to get us to where we're going. Oh. The challenge though, is how oh. to work with destruction in such a way that leads us to, to life. I hate to interrupt you, but that's you over time. If you can wrap up now, please. Okay, yes, I will. The slide that I'm not able to show you is our birth. We come from the invisible. We literally are the invisible made visible, and that within those systems, when women work together, we can create the rules, regulations, laws, and policies that actually we learned when we were in the infrastructures of our mother. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Oh, sorry to have to interrupt you. Um, next up, we have Shalanda Baker. Professor Shalanda Baker is Professor of Law, Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University. 
She's an affiliate faculty member in Northeastern's Global Resilience Institute and Department for Political Science. She teaches courses at the law school and in the College of Social Science and Humanities. Professor Baker spent three years as an associate professor of law at William Richardson School of Law, University of Hawaii, where she was the founding director of the Energy Justice Programme. Prior to that, she served on the faculty of University of San Francisco uh, School of Law. Um, she worked before, uh, immediately after law school, she worked as a corporate and project finance attorney in both the Boston and Tokyo offices of the law firm Bingham and McCutcheon. Um, she serves on the boards of the Solutions Project and the Clean Energy Group. She is the co-founder and co-director of the Initiative for Energy Justice. Over to you, Professor Baker. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am just so moved uh, by today's panel, and I feel incredibly honored to share the stage with um, such fierce leaders in the climate justice movement, in the movement to ensure that feminist voices and principles make their way into this transition um, that we are all involved in. So I am also a storyteller like O, and I think today I wanna take you on a little bit of a journey um, and the question that I found myself sort of grappling with as I prepared for today is, you know, how do you condense a lifetime into a 10 minute presentation? <laughs> so I'm going to do what I can um, and hopefully you won't get whiplash because we're going to go a little bit around the globe. So last night was a pretty cold night. It was the first cold night that we had experienced here in Boston since last winter late, and, and late spring. Um, and last night kind of brought up some memories of me, of growing up as a young girl in Austin, Texas, where on cold nights like last night, um, my sister and I would pile blankets high on our beds. Um, we would sometimes uh, boil water um, to uh, add to our, our bath water um, because we, my, my mother and my family lack the resources to pay for energy. Um, the, the reason for that is the extensive energy burden that our family experienced. And so energy burden is the amount of overall household income that a family or household pays to meet their energy needs. Around the country, Energy burden is on average around 2.3% of overall income um, to 3.1%. In some families, in low to moderate income households, um, in many black, indigenous, and people of color households, that percentage goes up to 7% and sometimes 30%. Our household was one of those households where the cost of energy was sometimes too much. And we were a part of this fabric, this invisible problem um, that persists in this country, with this country which has no um, true safety net. And much of that is, is back on the surface. So fast forward a few years um, to Colorado, the Air Force Academy, which is where I went to college. Um, I was a queer young woman discovering my sexuality at the height of the don't ask, don't tell policy. And what that meant was that I had to hide who I was on a daily basis. Um, I eventually did come out um, under the policy um, because I was in an abusive relationship with a woman who threatened to out me to the military um, if, I, if I chose to leave that relationship. Um, I chose myself and I chose life and I chose to enter a lifetime um, of activism. And so rather than view these lived experiences as liabilities, um, I actually view them as the source of strength and a source of my superpower. And so I started this presentation with a question to all of you, which is when was the first time that you realized that you had unique superpowers based on your unique lived experience? And so I think my experience is growing up um, in an energy insecure and energy burdened household um, that was headed by a single mother, a single black woman, and my experiences in the military as a queer young woman of color um, gave me the unique superpower to see and then challenge structural inequality and structural racism 
in all of their many insidious forms. Um, I'm, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Are you able to share your presentation full screen? Oh, um, I am. Let's try again. Um, so we could see the first slide, but we couldn't see it in presentation mode. Perfect. Is Thank it? You. Okay. Yeah, Zoom sometimes has problems. So I'm glad you're with me. Thanks for chiming in. Um, okay, so uh, I, I think I'm uniquely positioned based on my life experience um, to have an intervention, uh, a feminist intervention, an anti-racist intervention in this energy transition. And the first place I realized that was in Mexico. Again, I told you I was going to take you on a little bit of a, a journey today, um, a world tour. So um, about a decade ago in 2009, 2010, I found myself in a place called Oaxaca, Mexico, which is one of the windiest places in the world and home to um, a very rich and thriving um, indigenous culture where there are 14, over 14 unique and distinct indigenous groups um, who have lived on that land for millennia, right? And because it is the windiest place in the world, it has been this, become the site of extensive wind energy development. And when I realized that indigenous peoples were being displaced and dispossessed in the same way that they were displaced and dis dispossessed within the fossil fuel um, energy system, I understood that so long as we're relying on the same logics of extraction, capitalism, and profit to facilitate this energy transition, we are going to replicate replicate the inequality that is deeply embedded within this energy transition. And so that was over 10 years ago when I began this journey um, to really understand the meaning of energy justice. Um, a few years later, I found myself teaching at the University of Hawaii um, at the law school there. And some of you may already know this, but Hawaii is one of the first states to sort of challenge and think about um, a 100% clean energy future. I landed in Hawaii right before the state adopted its 100% renewable energy portfolio standard, um, which is a goal that the state hopes to reach by 2045. Um, Hawaii is also a, a state with some of the highest energy costs, in fact, the highest energy costs in the country. So that means that families um, that are low income are extremely burden, burdened. Um, that's black, indigenous, people of color, households. Um, and so I knew, based on my experience doing work in Mexico and based on my lived experience, uh, that we were again up against the same sort of problem where we were doomed to replicate the inequality in the um, energy transition if we didn't at least give light, shed light on the social dimensions of our energy system. Many of the people in Hawaii, the policymakers, the stakeholders who were involved in designing this transition, saw energy as a purely technical issue. And that this was the transition, it was only about shifting fuels from fossils to, to renewables. Um, but many of us who are on the ground working on these issues see the energy transition as one that is uniquely social, since energy touches on every single aspect of life. And so from there, I started the um, energy justice program at the University of Hawaii, um, which was designed to sort of link the social dimensions and the grassroots perspectives on energy um, to the broader policy discussions that were happening concerning the energy transition. Um, I now run an organization called the Initiative for Energy Justice, which provides national research support and um, technical assistance to frontline communities. So environmental justice communities, indigenous communities, folks who are um, on the front lines of climate change and who are, will experience the first and worst impacts of our climate change crisis. Um, we, we provide research support to them as well as to policymakers who don't understand how to center equity within this energy transition. And so uh, in the last um, five minutes or so, or two minutes, <laughs> I see, um, I wanna just talk about where we are. So we're in a moment um, of an extraordinary reckoning where we are reckoning with the racism and structural inequality that is embedded in our system. And I would argue that the energy system is not immune from that reckoning. Um, we have communities who for decades have lived in the shadow of fossil fuel 
um, generating facilities. We know through research that black and brown bodies absorb more toxins than they create, and they absorb far more toxins than um, their white counterparts. And in essence, they, ha they can't breathe, and they haven't been able to breathe um, for many decades. We also know that energy insecurity is a problem in this country. A 2015 study showed that 30% of Americans experience some sort of energy insecurity. Um, but that problem is extraordinary in black and brown communities where nearly half and sometimes over half uh, of the folks in our communities are experiencing energy insecurity. And that's what I experienced as a child. Um, we also know that due to COVID-19, many people are going to experience um, utility shutoffs. We have moratoria that were enacted around the country, but those are starting to expire. We have 18 moratoria that are still live, um, but 18 um, have already expired and five more are, are expiring soon, if not already. And this is millions and millions of households. So what is revolutionary power? Um, revolutionary power is basically the call to stop killing us. Um, it means designing an energy system that allows for clean energy access in, in low to moderate income communities and communities of color, uh, local energy, local clean energy, um, which has not been a feature, um, which has not been uniformly and equitably distributed across all communities in this country, and also means using the energy system as a source for economic empowerment. Um, and so I would encourage you to use your superpower, to discover it, and to use your voice in creating change. Um, and I've written a book about this and many other things that you can find in January. Thank you so much. And I apologize for the technical difficulties early on. Not at all. Thank you so much, Alanda. Okay, so finally, we have um, Diana Duarte. Diana is um, Director of Policy and Strategic Engagement at MADRA leading the organization's policy, public education and communications work, and designing and implementing initiatives to advance women's human rights worldwide. She also directs MADRA's Feminist Policy Jumpstart Initiative, partnering with grassroots women worldwide, and bringing their perspectives and analysis to shape US policymaking. For more than 14 years, she has worked in policy analysis and communications to advocate for human rights, gender justice, and progressive change. Over to you, Diana. Thank you very much. And, and what an honor to be on this panel. And, and thank you to the organizers of this symposium for bringing us all together here. Um, as you just mentioned, my name is Diana Duarte. I'm with MADRE, which is an international uh, women's human rights organization. Um, I'm speaking to you from unceded Lenape land uh, from New York. Um, I want to start by drawing some connections to some of the themes that have really kicked off this symposium about the dominant paradigms of thinking that have generated the crises that we face, and also the shifts in paradigm that we need in order to, that we need to make in order to recover and transform. Uh, so writer and activist, Adrian Marie Brown has offered, I think a useful framing here, which is that quote, we're living inside someone else's imagination. And I find that useful to remember whenever I feel that weird cognitive dissonance, when I see policies and practices that are clearly and obviously destructive, but being presented as feasible, rational, or, or necessary. So when we're talking about uh, charting feminist pathways to just and sustainable futures, we're not just talking about landing on a, a new set of policy proposals or technocratic or bureaucratic fixes. Um, I really resonated with what you were just saying, Shalanda, about the danger of just reproducing those same injustices and oppressive systems if we think at that very superficial level. And I think some of the, uh, you know, many of the speakers that we've heard in the past couple of days have been very critical of that orientation. Um, you know, for instance, it's what we heard yesterday in the discussion around critiques of mainstream solutions that are, you know, so-called solutions to climate disaster, whether it's climate trading that puts a price on pollution or agrofuels that end up driving land grabs that displace people. So again, these proposals are put before us in a way that's meant to seem eminently reasonable. But again, that's because we're living in someone else's imagination. So the dominant discourse has trained many of us to measure whether something is valuable based on whether it's profitable or to understand resource exploitation and extraction as a, as a measure of advancement rather than of, of, of destruction. 
And so at Madre, you know, we partner with grassroots feminist and women-led groups all around the world who are on the front lines responding urgently every day to climate breakdown. And I think one of the greatest learnings from our partners has been that even as we do that urgent work to respond to and rebuild from disaster and catastrophe, we are constantly imagining and living out the future that we're, that we're trying to build. And that's what grassroots feminist work can help us engender. Um, you know, a fundamental shift in the paradigms that are guiding us on how to confront global climate breakdown. Again, to break out of the weird and dangerous imagination that we're trapped in. And we can be begin to imagine ways of living where, you know, care for people, for planet and for sustainable futures is prioritized above all. Um, uh, in one of Naomi Klein's books, many, her many books on climate, she says, quote, the right is right. And she means clearly not that they're right in terms of values, but that they do understand, they do see climate change as an existential threat. Again, not to their lives, as it is for so many, but to their ideologies. So, you know, former Trump advisor, uh, Sebastian Gorka once said, quote, you know, we probably all heard this, you, they want to take away your pickup truck, rebuild your home, they want to take away your hamburgers. Um, you know, Naomi Klein then quotes uh, Larry Bell, who's a professor and a policy advisor for the Conservative Heartland uh, Institute, saying that, you know, climate change has, quote, has little to do with the state of the environment and much to do with shackling capitalism and transforming the American way of life in the interests of global wealth redistribution. So the irony in this is that those on the hardcore right often immediately grasp often more often than people in the center do, uh, the kind of transformational change that we need and the threat to their economic worldview that the necessary climate change solutions will represent. So whether it's an embrace on policy solutions that are you know, bans on polluting activities and fossil fuels, whether it's new public spending, whether it's climate reparations. And we won't get to those major shifts without you know, collective and international cooperation the very kind that is powerfully felt and mobilized in both climate justice and in feminist movements worldwide. You know, uh, meanwhile, one of the biggest threats to addressing climate change is the surge of right wing and authoritarian movements that value, you know, the hierarchical over the collective and they value, you know, the ultra nationalist over the internationalist, you know, they value patriarchal values to, to, be, to be short and blunt about it. And nowadays, especially as we're approaching this election, we're talking a lot about what it means to nurture and defend democracy. And it strikes me that that question is also very much at the heart of both feminist and climate justice organizing. It's the, that drive towards a democratic impulse for people and communities to decide their own futures. Mm -hmm. And that is why the, the globalized authoritarian right throws everything that it has at both of those movements. I mean, we can all think of the murders of land defenders and climate justice organizers like Berta Cáceres. Um, we can think about the anti-feminist backlash that is so common to authoritarian governments who frame feminist organizing as an attack on religious values, on traditional family structures, on, on the state, because they know that their hold on power is fundamentally unstable and it can't prevail against the values and the paradigms that feminist and social justice and climate justice movements will, will mobilize. You know, I'm thinking as well of how uh, Brazil's misogynist president Bolsonaro replaced the human rights ministry with a family values ministry that was led by a conservative evangelical pastor. And this is the same head of state who removed uh, protections against indigenous lands and moved aggressively to open up the Amazon to commercial development. And uh, I mean, we all know we don't have to look far from right here at home in the US to see another president who's constantly on the attack against gender justice and against climate justice. So, so clearly we need transnational organizing to defeat that globalized right. And climate justice organizing is the perfect platform to do that because it's a truly global and urgent issue to which the right has no effective response because their business as usual is a death wish. It's, it's more profit driven extraction, it's more deregulation, it's more privatization of ecosystem. And all of that up against, you know, the true uncompromising limits of our physical environment. And so, so something has to give, and so that's their Achilles heel. And I would argue that we already have what we need in order to fight back. And we can start by delving into current and successful movement strategies. Um, you know, want to reflect a little bit on the theme of connectedness, which has come up a lot in the symposium. 
you know, just as the need to understand the links between issues that social movements are addressing globally has never been grading, greater, we are building the muscles to do that. You know, social movements and activists are increasingly making linkages across issues, sustainability, feminism, peace, as we heard in the earlier presentation today by, by Carol and Claire around economic justice. We can see that recognition of interconnectedness you know, driving the movement to block pipelines like at Standing Rock, where we saw allies being drawn from across the country and across the world and across movements. Um, you know, we also see it in the growing conversation around the need to close military bases and end the massive carbon emissions of the US, of US militarism. Um, you know, making those connections contributes to mobilizing power. It pulls people from different perspectives and spaces into common cause. So there's this growing constituency for climate action, including from those who have seen or experienced the impacts of climate disaster. But one thing that sometimes has confounded the left in recent years is what, uh, the lack of like a co coherent, hopeful, galvanizing narrative. You know, it, on the right, they have their calls to tradition or to patriotism. Um, but I think that, you know, this, this symposium has really uplifted that you know visions of just transition uh, can supply that narrative that we need feminist visions can supply that narrative that we need but it has to be presented as something more than just avoiding the worst avoiding ecological collapse it gives us a hopeful vision you know decarbonization not as deprivation but as a better way of life where our lives are, are caring are collective and in balance um, you know, rather than exploited, overworked, and isolated. And uh, to paraphrase the Black feminist writer, Tony Cade Bumbra, we have to make our, the futures we envision irresistible to people. And um, some of the work that Bridget was describing through the Feminist Green New Deal Coalition, I think points in that direction. You know, it's noteworthy that before in the coalition work that we've been doing, before we got into questions of policy and strategy and the nitty gritty around all that, we started with values because we understand that, that those kinds of values can be galvanizing. They offer a, a starting point for a, those of us who are situated in different spaces to develop mechanisms for coordination once we understand we're aligned a, a, along these values. Um, and so that's something that, that progressive social movements often lack is those mechanisms for coordination. And what we don't need is some kind of like massive international conference to do that. You know, we don't need um, a million new convenings. What we need is a way for strategic coordination and joint platforms to be developed. And so once we're aligned in those principles and values, we can hone in on modes of organizing that are, for example, horizontal and community-based. So we're able to be translocal and make connections across communities and across the distance. And we also need modes of organizing that are, are vertical. So we're able to draw connections between what's happening in, in local councils all the way to what's happening in, in like the UN Security Council. And no, no one of us, no one organization is plugged in in all those ways. So we need to consider role clarity around different groups working in different spaces, coordinating together, all of which is about inducing change. And I'll close just by saying that, you know, too often, you know, we're, we're living in someone else's imagination, as Adrienne Marie Brown says, but I will say that the value of spaces like this one is that it allows us to hone in on a new and more powerful imaginary, imaginary and give it, you know, weight and, and shape together um, so that someday we can live in the imagination that we're building together. Thank you, Diana. Um, thank you all for a most stimulating set of presentations. So before I turn um, to audience questions, I'd love to hear you all say a little bit more about um, one or two things that have emerged in your panel, but throughout over the course of the whole symposium. And the first would be um, thinking back to Carol in her opening remarks and her framing remarks um, at the start of the symposium, she talked about the necessity for feminists to um, shift both entrenched power and dominant narratives. And I wondered if that framing resonated with you. I think some of you um, talked quite explicitly about it, maybe for others it was, it was sort of implicitly there, but I wondered if you just wanted to reflect more on whether you think that is the task, is it that twin task of, of challenging entrenched power, dominant narratives? And if that is the task as you see it, more about the how, 
you know, and what's the relationship between them? Is there is there one that comes before the other? Does one affect the other, or or how is it, you know easier to start with one? And relatedly, and this really picks up on something Diana said towards the end. I wondered um, all of you if you might think of examples from feminist activism on other issues where we've been successful at challenging entrenched power and dominant narratives from which we can learn in our efforts to uh, confront the climate crisis. So you don't need to, that's a kind of multifaceted question. Pick, pick any of it that resonates with you. And I'll just um, ask you all to offer your reflections maybe in the order of, of the panel. So Lindsay, if you're happy to go first. So <laughs> would anyone like to go first? Bridget, would you like to? Are you waving because you would? Oh, you're, you, are, you would like to go. Wonderful. Yeah, I think um, in previous conversations, what I was hearing is the distinction between the bureaucracy of death, business as usual, the bureaucracy of destruction, and the bureaucracy of life. It's like how it's about shifting a consciousness of destroying life and then facilitating healing. And I think a large part of that is what we're doing, which is practicing the art of actually doing deep listening and then organizing the thoughts and then turning those thoughts into policy. So basically it's a shift from death and destruction, a suicidal, when you talked about um, somebody else's imagination, I would say somebody else's nightmare. <laughs> this is a nightmare. Anyone else like to chip in? Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Diana. Go Just ahead, Diana. Briefly, um, I, I'm reflecting a little bit on the question of how we go about engaging in, in paradigmatic work and shifting paradigms and what is the ordering of operations, perhaps. And I think that one of the great lessons that we've learned, that I've learned through, through our work, is that it's always happening through every action that you're doing, whether it's you know, urgent humanitarian aid work or policy advocacy, how we're choosing to do, you know, to communicate our work and message it. Like in every interaction that we're engaging in, we are either building or tearing down paradigms. And, um, and so I think that, so I, I struggle a little bit with sort of like the linear way of thinking about it. You know, um, we're always uh, engaging in, in that kind of work. Um, and, and I will just also say briefly that in terms of uh, where, we can, where we can learn from successful strategies in how, uh, in, of our history, it's always been people power. I think that's been one of the themes of, of this whole symposium. It's always been, you know, what does it take to inspire and mobilize people and, um, and, and channel, channel that kind of power into levers of, of change? And I think that that, you know, I'm sure that others um, have seen that in their work as well. I'll just add, um, as Lindsay and Bridget, feel free to chime in as well. Um, so I think that is absolutely my work. Um, the idea of challenging entrenched power. I mean, I see power um, in so many ways as political power, but also the energy system. And you know, the transformation of the energy system is a key component of this broader transformation that we want. Um, but for me, the work is not just challenging the entrenched power, um, but making it visible because the energy system um, is created by a series of invisible rules and policy choices that have led to the structural violence that we see in black and brown communities. And so um, because the lights generally come on, people don't really think about um, the embedded power uh, and the dynamics that um, have led to uh, undesirable outcomes, particularly in Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. So for me, the work is making it visible. And I think we do that um, through storytelling. So um, my forthcoming book is, I've described it as part memoir, part, part love story for the planet uh, and part policy guide which is a radical intervention as a professor. I mean, I'm, you know, we talk, I'm speaking in the first person. I'm speaking from my experience. And I think the more we tell our stories, 
the more we can change the dominant narratives. Um, and, and I think that's where the power is. Bridget or Lindsay, you want to come in on yeah. that? Yeah, thinking of, um, in terms of how I do a lot of my work and in different movement, movement spaces that I'm a part of, I think it's also the idea of listening to other folks as well and listening to understand and not necessarily to respond. Um, so for instance, um, one thing that we really believe in at ICA is the idea of mentorship. So not only in terms of an older person mentoring somebody who's younger, but also younger folks being able to mentor older folks as well. So I think a lot of it in terms of paradigm shifts also means listening to folks that are younger as well um, and taking different ideas from youth, um, but also even just thinking um, of having difficult conversations within our communities as well. So for many indigenous communities, we have a lot of anti-Black sentiments. We have a lot of patriarchal, transphobic, homophobic ideas as well as a result of colonization and those ideas being brought into our communities. So I think it's also being willing to have these difficult conversations amongst ourselves as well. So it's not only fighting for the rights of our communities, but also thinking of how are we bringing along all of these other structurally oppressed communities as well. And maybe just to, to jump in with, you know, these, I think that, that the crux of it, there's uh, kind of speaking to what Diana said as well, it's hard to think about these as kind of uh, in a linear way of this needs to happen for this to happen, because I think, and it was part of uh, what I, what I see is being shown through this symposium is that you know, I think I try try to think in ecosystems at all at all moments, including building an ecosystem to shift power, because I think it needs it needs that ground of what do we need to build. It's just not only where are we going with it, but how are we building together that's actually going to do the work to shift dominant narratives and power structures. And I think even this panel is a great example of the different approaches to giving context to thinking about the levers and pathways to shifting and bringing in individual storytelling to give life and inspiration and and you know a guiding star to what it is that we're trying to actually say we there's no one way in which not only can we listen to and understand and kind of uh, internalize what this power shifting process is going to be i really appreciated o's you know, into, you know, bringing us into this idea of what is, what is metamorphosis and transformation? What does that look like in a very internalized way? Uh, and I think it's, there's something extremely beautiful in a feminist um, collective building and ecosystem building in that way that allows for their, those multiple types of storytellings and types of interventions to exist. And I think they are all deeply necessary together. And so I guess for me, that's why that emphasis on we, we have to come from the starting point of recognizing that if we're not doing this work through an understanding of how power is created and concentrated, then we are not going to be able to come up with this, the diversity of solutions that we need in order to actually shift that power. So there was a slide in Bridget's presentation about um, COP, the Conference of the Parties, a UN framework convention on climate change. And one of the images in the slide was from a panel that was about a feminist Green New Deal. Um, and I think this speaks a little bit to the question that you asked, Claire. Um, so I was at the COP, uh, first one, it was wild um, and unproductive, but I attended all of the sort of feminist track, you know, activist tracked um, workshops but then I would pop into the main negotiation, which was filled with men um, and the dominant voices were white, right? And the women who were in the room were sort of structurally silenced in a really perverse way. And so I think we have to reckon with the work that is still ahead of us. Um, uh, one of the, mo the bright spots of the COP was this movement was this um, action that was coordinated among the feminist group as well as the youth and there was it was so disruptive and beautiful and you know a sea of people of all generations kind of rushed in to take up space in this meeting that was not going anywhere and you could see people getting caught up in it and choosing in a moment to say i'm in or i'm out 
and the stakes of being in that in that action were high because you got expelled. Um, so it was a beautiful moment, but I think we need to recognize that there's a conversation that is happening and the world is being created um, in that perverse imagination. But the more we can take up space and just bring people with us um, on that on that path, I think will be powerful. Yeah, and that's uh, you bring up an issue that's of real interest to me because, of course, it's Scotland that hosts the next COP next November. So that is another question I did want to ask you all. A kind of if you were able to be in the room where it happens at COP next year, what would be the, you know, if you could bring one feminist insight from this symposium to the key decision makers at the COP, then what might that be? I, I, I can go, I suppose. Um, so I, I was also at the, the last COP as well in Madrid and will more than likely be at the next one um, as part of the Indigenous Peoples Caucus at COP. Um, and I think part of it is, um, yeah, having, having representation, even thinking in terms of the Indigenous Peoples Caucus, one thing that actually came up in caucus was that most of our, our leadership among caucus is all Indigenous men. Uh, and so we actually ended up kind of making our own kind of side Indigenous women and gender queer folks kind of kind of group to talk through things. And we actually ended up composing a letter that we then read out to all of caucus about the need for Indigenous women and gender queer folks to also be um, at the forefront of, of caucus as well, uh, because we have so much, you know, frontline experience and we do hold so much knowledge among our communities as well. Um, so I think there's that. And then I think a lot of it is also, um, again, in, in the idea of representation is just having our voices be, be heard and be recognized. Um, COP is a very difficult space to get, you know, media attention and things like that. And we were having difficulties, even getting something like a press conference is hard. Um, one of the most difficult parts as well of COP is seeing the amount of attention that white folks get in comparison to BIPOC folks as well. Um, something that have, Greta came through at one point in Madrid um, and it was just it was just insanity to see that all of this media just congregate around her and it's not to say anything against Greta but it's just you know it was just this representation of we have all of these indigenous folks and so many indigenous youth as well that were there but then the minute that Greta stopped the minute that Greta came through it was just like madness like all all of the media was around Greta um, and she actually ended up giving some of her time away on a panel to an indigenous youth named Rose um, who ended up being able to speak to indigenous rights and white supremacy um, and that was just a really good example of you know solidarity and what solidarity um, in action can look like as well. Thanks Lindsay. Anyone else want to share what they would bring to COP that might make a difference? Well, I could come just quickly on this. Um, <clears throat> so it's an interesting question and, and in sort of, again, where that sort of mapping out of where we need to pull levers and, and where we need to organize in this kind of, in this space, I think we have always seen and utilized the COP as a space for movement building. Um, and, and, you know, very much understood that the UNFCCC and the COP is not, a feminist space. It's actually a site of trauma in many ways. It is a trade agreement, which is a carbon metric focused market based trade agreement. Um, and so we go in with with an understanding that that is what this space is. And yet we also see that we can still use it because there is there is a, a real importance in multilateralism. We still find a real importance to have a space where if we really believe in the idea of global justice, how do we create a framework where countries who are facing the fiercest and, and current impacts of climate change have a voice where they wouldn't have in any other kind of, of, of um, 
framework essentially. And so what it has been, it's absolutely right what Sholanda says as well in terms of watching those dynamics. It's absolutely right what Lindsay says in terms of seeing how not only the tokenization of representation, what happens, I think a, the key example of that is the fact that you have someone like Greta who is striking, um, being, you know, coming in, being invited into a cop space, being put at the front lines of, of, of panels because of this act of civil disobedience. There was an article that, um, that on the same day, there were two emails that came in my inbox. One was a, an article from the former executive secretary of the UNFCCC, Christiana Figueres, calling for people, for leaders to start putting their bodies on the line in, in terms of civil disobedience. And the second was a response letter from the UNFCCC secretariat to the, um, the, the harassment complaint that we had made as constituencies in the UNFCCC to the harm and the violence and the treatment of people who protested in the COP space. And so politicians are very happy to use the civil disobedience and the, and the bodies in the streets to to be the, the wind in their sails for political will, and yet we still see huge violence um, against uh, any environmental defender in, in many countries around the world. So there's that, that disconnect between what it is that we're pushing and the authoritarianism that just exists throughout um, each of these countries and each of these spaces is very visible to us. And so when we go into those COP spaces, it is always about understanding the levers of power that we are trying to pull. I could tell you we have a whole list of key demands that we want to make to the, the COP26 presidency around the gender action plan and centering disability justice and advancing, truly advancing the rights of indigenous peoples is having a stake in a, in a, in a seat at the table. Um, but we also need to do that really, really deep work of calling out the hypocrisy in that space. And I think where we're building and where there's a lot of opportunity is when we as movements come together and bring fierce disruption into that space. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say that's, that's, I'm not, that's not my key demand to the cup presidency, but certainly trying to help them see where this is a site for, for, you know, building movement and political will. Diana or O, do you want to come in here? And if and if not, I'm going to turn, uh, yeah, Diana, on you go. I just want to make a connection because I'm, I'm really struck by what, what um, Shalanda, Bridget, and Lindsay are saying about sort of like the experience of being in the COP and the underlying discussion we've been having around who is a threat and what is a threat because the level of reaction that um, you are all describing, right, in terms of um, you know, siloing and exclusion, in terms of, of violence and trauma, it seems, you know, it's 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 a it's a very strong reaction, and I think it's also a defensive reaction against the the what what the what this kind of movement organizing represents. And so I, the connection that came up in my mind is when you all were saying before, I'm not a threat, and I think it's true. Like individually, we're not threats, but I think that what we represent as a broader movement is fundamentally threatening to dominant discourses, to dominant ideologies, to business as, as usual. And I think that that underlies, um, you know, some of the, the reactions and the, and the protocols and practices that you all were, were describing. Cool. I'm still thinking about that. I'm thinking about the concept of um, threat and I, and I want to continue to sit with that a bit. Sure, sure. Um, I was going to turn to questions from the audience, but the audience have gone quiet on us. Um, despite in previous panels, we had too many questions to answer. So let me ask you something that came up in the last panel from an audience question. Um, and that's around, I suppose, different feminist strategies and, and the, the extent to which they can be uh, complementary or sometimes clashing. Um, when you were listening to each other, did you all feel that you were in alignment and, uh, and, your, and the different things you were talking about were complementary? Or were there points where you thought, mm, I don't know if I would use that strategy? And maybe when you're thinking about that, you can be reflecting on the previous panel as well as this one. So the whole, we've had a, a, a lot of different strategies if you take both panels together. 
so you know there are multiple feminisms right with uh, a range of different tactics and strategies does it matter when they are they sometimes clash do you see them as all being complementary anyone want to pick up on that debate I guess while people are thinking one thing, I'm sorry, oh, did you want to come in? No. Um, so, you know, I would say that the, there are things that, um, there are approaches at these intersections which have been challenging in terms of the way that they, um, that they are not structural in their analysis or intersectional in the way I would say we would want a feminist approach to a sustainable future. Um, and a lot of that can often be when the solutions are grounded in individual over collective liberation. And I think that there you, for example, will see projects that focus on, okay, we want to create um, a, a just transition. So we're going to invest in women as uh, entrepreneurs, um, individual women, and you know, they're, it's often uh, perhaps a company who's thinking through this project and sort of putting this in the guise of this is feminist action for climate change. It's just examples I've seen before where there's no kind of reflection on the impact that that you know, organization, institution, et cetera, is having more broadly to add to the climate crisis, to environmental degradation, because the focus is towards, you know, uplifting and empowering in the singular and in the individual and not in an intersectional or introspective way. Um, and so that can, you know, what it means is that there's often a, um, we're often confronted with ideas of like, oh, here's a here's a solution to climate change that is inherently feminist because it is sorry, sorry, that is inherently feminist because it is quote unquote women led, right? Without a real understanding of what it is we mean by that. And so I think I think where the you know the dive and that's being at the same time, you know, it's it is understanding what Shalanda had said from the beginning that when we're talking about the challenges that we're facing, we're going to need programs and projects that are about enhancing women's leadership and voice and access into certain spaces. So it's not necessarily saying that um, that this is unique across all all pieces, but I would I would pinpoint that as a fundamental challenge. And it's really a co-optation of feminism as opposed to what I would call a feminist approach to what what we're doing here. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, the audience question, the Q&A button is lighting up now. So unless anyone else wanted to answer that question about uh, complementarity or con or clashing yeah. strategies, I'll just go to the audience. Yes, yeah, Shalanda? Sure. Um, you know, I, I just have so much respect and gratitude for the comments that have been made. And I think there's nothing that I'm in um, opposition to in terms of what has been presented, but I think my own work can be internally inconsistent, which is to say that I am interested in revolution and I'm a lawyer who is making <laughs> changes at the margins, right? And so how do we, again, it's sort of the Audre Lord, <laughs> you know, using the master's tools to, to free us. I mean, I am, my eye is on the revolution, but I am absolutely concerned about our imminent needs. And I, I'm aware that um, the type of change I seek may not, be a, may not be available through changing rules, laws, policies, but I still have to do that work. And so, I mean, it's just an internally inconsistent feeling. And, you know, you asked about the COP, Claire, and I'm just like, I was so disheartened. I've been teaching about the COP for a decade. And when I went, I mean, everything that, that I have taught in terms of how the power dynamics play out global north global south I mean it was all in front of me and I was like this is why we can't get anything done so um so yeah I mean I just wanted to highlight some internal my own kind of internal inconsistency around approach right um I'm going to uh, ask Melissa to come in here because I can see that the audience um do now have some questions so uh, Melissa can you um ping them to the panel yeah, absolutely. 
So the first question that I want to pose is actually one that also came up in a prior panel, but we didn't have time to ask. Um, and it's around the issue of co-option and, and sort of how feminist or feminist, um, like the term itself is sort of used by corporations, by gover governments, by, um, I don't know, structures and, and different kind of ways that it comes up and that aren't actually bringing a feminist perspective um, and how each of you might deal with that in your own work, um, but also sort of how you understand it as um, a barrier to, or a barrier or like how you would deal with it um, on a broader level. I think I can speak to this more so less of a like feminist, but more so just indigenous as well. Um, so as we know, many BIPOC folks are tokenized in many different arenas. Um, and so I think just in the case, I think a really good example is in Canada, just uh, two days ago, the liberal government announced that they would be banning six single use plastics by the end of 2021. So things like straws, plastic bags. Um, and so it's just, there, there's such incredible irony to that when they're banning single use plastics, but then approving pipelines like TMX <laughs> at the same time. Um, so I think a lot of it is, you know, we have governments, corporations, organizations that, you know, claim to uplift indigenous rights and sovereignty. It seems like, you know, women's rights and sovereignty, all these different things, um, but not actually doing it in practice. So I think a lot of times it's the recognition of what does actual uh, solidarity look like? What does it mean to have engagement from oppressed communities uh, rather than just tokenization? So, you know, a lot of times they'll be, oh, well, we have one person on our board who's <laughs> indigenous or we have, you know, we consulted with one indigenous person. So therefore that gives the, the check mark of all indigenous communities. Um, so I think a lot of it is just understanding what adequate representation and consultation looks like. Just riffing off of that a little bit, I feel like the example that you were just giving, Lindsay, uh, connects to a point that you were making before, Bridget, about the individual versus the collective, right? When the big declarative action is around banning single-use plastics and all of that, it situates the, the fundamental action that we need at the level of individual choice um, and the choice of, of small businesses or whatever, rather than on the the in the grand scale in terms of the wider systemic change that, that is needed. And I think that's part of where a lot of the danger around co-optation lies is that it's a diversion from the kinds of solutions that will create the change that we wanna see, but it gives people the feeling of having done something, right? Um, and uh, uh, one other thing I was gonna say about, um, and this is a bit of a segue or a sidebar, but I'll just mention it here. Um, when we're talking about working in some of these uh, compromised spaces, whether they're policy spaces or otherwise, and you know how, how do we justify our time and our efforts and our energies in those spaces? And sometimes it is around saying, you know, what are the, the timeline that it takes to make the kind of paradigm shift that we need is not necessarily overnight. So we're doing that movement building work in those different spaces in the hopes that we're inching towards the outcomes that we want and the mindset changes that we need. In, at, at the same time, the, the tension with that is that, you know, the, the, the time is not on our side, right, in terms of making some of these broader systemic and paradigmatic changes that we need. And, um, and so where I, where I derive some hope in that is that um, sometimes uh, enormous changes happen at the last minute, including in people's ways of looking at the world. And that just feels like one of the grand lessons of 2020, as we've all been struck by crisis after crisis, including the pandemic. I know just even in my own personal life and in some of the communities that I'm part of, just seeing conversations around questions of care in our world and, and collective approaches in our world are just accelerating at a rate that um, is you know, tragic that it's engendered by, by this, this pandemic, but also has a glimmer of hope in it in terms of like the kinds of changes people are willing to make. And also to bring back to the original point to like see past the like limited co-opted solutions that, that are often served up to us. That people are like, no, that's not, that's not what we need actually. All the crisis we're facing is making me realize that the change that I want and that I want for my family and the people I love is, 
is much more fundamental. And so a ban on plastic straws is not going to do it, you know? Yes, I noticed that um, in the movement work that we were doing through Philly Thrive, change happened at the speed of trust. To the degree in which we were able to build relationships of trust across those lines is how we were then able to facilitate both the personal change, the political change, and then, off, and then the outcome of a 150-year-old oil refinery being shut down. But it was about building alliance and trust in the community. Did anyone else want to speak on that one or should I move to the next question? Move to the next question? Okay. Um, so I think a couple of different people, and this is definitely something that you all have spoken to in varying different degrees, but just sort of the impact, um, I think both organizationally, kind of in how you actually do your work, and then also conceptually of the pandemic and kind of what that has done to feminist organizing spaces in particular, um, and sort of how you are moving forward within this context. You wanna go, Diana? I saw we unmuted at the same time. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so one thing that has, we do as an organization, um, you know, we, we see ourselves as, we're, we're quite small, but we have always worked in caucus in this space of our engagement in, in different policy processes is, is only possible if we build collective and in coalition with others to develop, you know, ideas and, and, and policies into these spaces. And so when the crisis became really, uh, the pandemic became really prevalent in, in all of our minds, it actually happened because I, I think the first kind of, of realization was this cancellation of the Commission on the Status of Women um, that was due to start in New York in early March, which is a really important space for feminist organizing and movement building. And so I saw, you know, we saw in the weeks after that, that there, there was starting to share the things that were happening so quickly in terms of the changes to um, in lockdowns and changes to plans and then also starting to think about okay what's the implication from a multilateral process perspective on the issues that we're working on and then this quick realization of like wow this is a deeply embodied crisis and we are all facing it as individuals as well and so our kind of modus operandi of like what's the global you know space that and what's happening at a policy level it was like what's happening to us as individuals in our homes and in our communities and so we, you know, one thing that we did was we sort of, we looked to all of those solidarity spaces that we have in the different global policy processes. And we were like, should we just have a phone call and see how we're doing? And that was probably at the end of March. And since the end of March, we have been in collective together, meeting together every Monday, um, every other Monday here and now uh, in, in recent months. Um, and it started out very much like, doing meditation together and breathing together and hearing about the struggles and what people were facing and then quickly you know as feminists do we kind of said okay we need to create a repository you know of marking these moments of what's happening where are we seeing things being put in place such as lockdowns how is this impacting issues around migration how is it impacting labor and care i mean fundamentally everyone was like this is going to be on the backs of women in so many spaces and so in ho households and homes, it's going to be on the backs of indigenous peoples and communities and black women and people of color. Like, you know, it was all you didn't, we didn't need to wait for the analysis to come out to know that this is the reality that was going to be faced. Um, and that there was an op that, you know, that there was going to be this moment as well in terms of how governments reacted to it, where the assumption was, yes, maybe some will invest in care, but some will bail out the fossil fuel industry and bail out the aviation industry over 
uh, our communities and over our investing in our healthcare. And so I would just, I think that all of that is to say we, we have this feminist COVID response website now, which is kind of the output from this collective that came together, which again was just how do we create both a repository of things that are happening? How do we create a set of principles of what a feminist response looks like? And how do we create a shared memory of what we're experiencing here? Um, and all of that is to, to say that we know that there are things in this moment that we can mark that should never change. We, you know, we kind of immediately started problematizing this back to uh, build back better. Sort of we, we're, we don't wanna just build back better. We can't build back to anything. We have to build a, a more sustainable, just future. So I, I would say that there are a lot of concerns. There's a lot of, there's going to be a lot more, um, uh, you know, hardship for so many. And we're seeing the detrimental impacts that this has had, particularly on the lives of, of women and girls around the world. Um, but there's also, I think, a moment in here, as I think Diana was saying, where all of a sudden, People, I mean, I'll just say from my experience, the climate movement really wants to talk about the care economy now in a way that they hadn't before. And so I do think that there's potential opportunity here to learn from the things that were so called quote unquote impossible and how they were made possible in this moment. Diana, you, you um, were first, so please go ahead, share your thoughts. Um, I'll be really brief because I, I, I felt like the question was, was um, I started to answer it in, in my last um, response about how the appetite for, uh, you know, really bold, radical, transformative solutions is heightened through crisis. And, you know, uh, all of us who've been working on confronting climate crisis for a long time have, have, have experienced that, right? The, this understanding, this aha moment of, uh, you know, it's not just business as usual. We need dramatically new ways of living together. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's been, as I was saying, deepened and accelerated in this year in response to this pandemic. Um, I'll also say, Bridget, the, the last, your, the meeting I had with you was the last meeting that I had in, in March. So when I said goodbye to you was when the lockdown started. So I have that as when you talk about like all of those rapid changes in March, like I can, I can picture it very, very easily. Um, and, what, and we also have engaged in, I think, like a similar process of feeling like we feel very alone in lockdown, but we want to feel connected through these technologies that we're taking advantage of now and to be able to understand how people are experiencing this crisis in their communities in very different ways. So um, at Madre, we've convened, I don't even know how many now, but maybe dozens of exchanges virtually with our, with our partners around the world to better understand how they're experiencing this interlocking set of crises in, in, in their communities, how we can be um, in solidarity with each other, and how we can also build like a, an integrated shared understanding of how this is uh, uh, affecting the world globally. I'm thinking about what um, Carol said at the, on the first day about situated knowledge being a, a feminist framework, understanding embodied knowledge and how each of us through our lived experience can bring, can hone that together, right? And so I think that that's been another um, lesson of, of 2020, which is that we're, yes, we're alone. We may be locked down in our houses, but we're able to kind of network and build an ecosystem of, of shared knowledge nonetheless. Thank you, Shalanda. <laughs> Oh, sure. Um, I'm just, again, so moved and inspired by the work that people are doing. Um, and I would say that the pandemic for me and for the folks that I have um, on my team and that I work with uh, has just elevated the work. Um, I mean, we have been fighting for an anti-racist, anti-oppression approach to energy policy for several years now. For, and I've been doing it for the better part of a decade. And um, this pandemic has just revealed, right? I mean, this is a thing everyone's saying. It's highlighted the, the ways that, um, you know, the system creates the structural violence. Um, and the energy system is absolutely a part of that. I mean, when Harvard Chan School of Public Health back in May published its, or, you know, issued its research paper that said that just a short, or, or just a small amount of uh, exposure um, over a long period to, to air pollution increases your, um, your mortality um, with respect to COVID. I mean, we knew that that meant that COVID was coming for black and brown communities. And so, um, you know, 
pulling a thread from Diana's pre early presentation, um, you know, drawing on Naomi Klein yet again, um, you know, one of her first books was disaster, um, was about disaster capitalism, right? And so I think we're in this moment where we absolutely have a fork in the road and it's either the sort of build back better, but using the same instruments, logics, tools, uh, capitalist structures to get to whatever the better is, or we have an opportunity for deep, deep transformation. Um, I don't know where we are on that, um, because we also know that our communities are gonna come out of this pandemic deeply, deeply under-resourced. Um, and so even in a, a hopeful new administration, we're gonna have to fight, we're gonna still have to fight for, for resources and structural transformation. So um, I'm hoping we take the, the more transformative path, but, but we know how this has gone in the past. I think I would also just highlight the need as well for our organizations and groups and collectives to also think about implementing these same sorts of policies that we want on a large scale within our own groups as well. Um, so at ICA, we decided to move down to a four day work week with the pandemic just because of people having, having children and having different people to take care of the, the mental health stress of all of this. Um, and our executive director, Ariel, as well, just went on a, a four month sabbatical uh, to take basically time for, for healing after, you know, decades of work within the climate justice movement and from being from a frontline um, community, a tar sands community as well. Um, so I think it's also just thinking of how are we implementing these policies we want to see on a grander scale within our communities. Um, I think it's also for us, at least internally, we, we've also gotten better at boundaries as well during the pandemic of, you know, saying more, saying no to more things, um, both as individuals and as an organization as well, you know, um, really saying like, well, actually, this is outside of my working hours, I'm not going to be able to, you know, answer your message or email, whatnot. So I think it's also, um, yeah, really forcing us to think internally as well, how are we implementing those, those same kind of ideals within our organizing. I know within our community, um, we went into high gear around community care movement. And so we created a tech circle in which we had um, the young students pull together all their tech equipment that they weren't using. We got it refurbished. We distributed the tech to our community members so that we could continue to have um, assemblies. Um, we then created food distribution to make sure that the community um, had food. We made sure that they had masks, hand sanitizers, things of that nature. We also created an exercise class um, to make sure that, you know, in that we were going to be sitting at this level to make sure that we were doing yoga, meditation together. And we also created entertainment. Um, we created a, a concert for fundraising so that the community would feel fully engaged while we were isolated and separated from each other. And so at first when COVID hit, um, there was this feeling of paralyzation at some level because we are a community that was used to going, um, knocking at doors, bringing people in, um, having parties, things of that nature to bond. And then we went into lockdown, as you were saying, and yet we still had to figure out how to maintain the integrity of our connection so as not to lose the momentum to bring us into the next stage. It's so fascinating. Oh, go ahead, Bridget. Oh, I was just gonna plug, I was so inspired. I love that you, you know, I, one thing I forgot to say in all the like, we created a website. We also created a Feminist Futures playlist on Spotify that y'all can find. And my colleagues started a Feminist Futures sci-fi book club as well. So just wanted to bring in those spaces is, that are really important to have. Sorry, Shalanda. Mm -hmm. No, I just wanted to comment on Lindsay's reflection on um, how her organization is sort of adjusting. Um, so, I, you know, at my university, uh, there's an acknowledgement that uh, folks have more childcare responsibilities and other things in this moment. Um, but rather than change the way we work, it's more about, well, here's an access to, um, you know, more childcare resources instead of sort of saying, 
let's put everything on the table and see, you know, how we're organizing our work days and how we're organizing the responsibilities, which tend to fall disproportionately on women, right? Even at the institutional level, right? So it's happening at the home and it's also happening in the institution. So again, I, I love this, the more transformative view that Lindsay, it sounds like you all have taken, but, um, but yeah, who, who knows what's, what's going to happen at, at the end of this tunnel that we're, we're currently in. Okay, well, this is a good moment for me to turn this back over to Claire um, to do a little bit of conclusion. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Melissa. Um, we just have um, a few minutes left. Um, although, you know, typically uh, brilliant questions came in towards the end. So it's uh, unfortunate we haven't had time to get to them all, but perhaps panelists can respond directly in the Q&A. But because we've just got a couple of minutes left, I'd like to call on each of our panelists to give their final thoughts. If there's one thing that you'd like people to take away from the panel, then what would it be? And we'll just go in the order in which you presented. So over to you, Lindsay. <laughs> Sorry, I keep doing this to you. You keep looking at me like yeah. that. <laughs> um, boy, I would say, uh, yeah, for, for a final thought, um, I think really just at the end of the day, it's always thinking of, you know, who's in the room and who is being who is being represented, who's getting a chance to, to speak and to have the floor is something that's so incredibly important. Um, I know that there are so many, you know, organizations that, um, you know, like to say that they very much lift up indigenous rights and sovereignty, um, but I think it's important to see what that looks like in practice as well. Um, I know that many of the spaces that I've been in in the environmental movement can be very difficult and triggering spaces to be in. Um, oftentimes as you know frequently the only indigenous person that might be in the space um you know and i think people need to always be willing to to learn and to grow um and to take feedback and to take criticism as well um you know especially in those different spaces if someone especially a bipoc is giving you some sort of a feedback as to how to make the space better how to make it be a safer space then i think that's something that's really important for for all of us in our in our movements to to really take and to take it to heart as well. Thank you, Lindsay. Bridget, your 60 seconds. It's really hard. I'm, I'm just really in gratitude for this space and for working in uh, being here with all of you in collective. And, and I just want to reiterate that for me, this is where the power for transformation actually really lies, even amongst a very, very challenging multiple intersecting forms of crisis. I, I really the well of inspiration comes from looking at the history of movements behind me, what that what they have overcome by choosing that fork in the road path towards transformation and feeling like we have that moment here and we have everything that we need to kind of break out of someone else's imagination and create our own. So just grateful for all of you and being here today. Thank you, Bridget. And all? Yes, I would say it's about the reimagining, um, reclaiming our sanity um, with deep listening. And in the process of participating in the deep listening, implement you know, how do we implement what it is we are hearing, recognizing that most of this that we are moving through is environmental violence. And I really appreciated the concept that when we heal the earth, we heal ourselves. And so um, just the deep listening and then implementing based on what we have heard. Wonderful, thank you all. And Shalanda? You know, the thing that's coming up for me uh, in closing is this idea um, that our stories matter and our stories are powerful. And it's not just the stories that we hold um, in, in this lifetime, but it's the stories of our parents and our ancestors and what they have been through, because I think they're a source of strength. Um, and I also think they, um, the stories that we have in this lifetime um, will lead us to that deeper truth. I, I so loved um, O's presentation and their uh, acknowledgement that this is a time to care for the heart to care for the mind and spirit, but it's it's everything has to be integrated um, in this in this moment. Um, but we have to tell the truth. We have to come from an authentic place. We have to sort of get get past some of the silos that have so dominated academia, activist spaces, 
um, and just the way we move through the world. So I'm all about the stories right now. <laughs> Thank you, Shalanda. And Diana? Well, continuing on the theme of, of stories and imagination and, and even dreams, I'm thinking based on you know what you all were just saying about that notion that you know we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. I might be paraphrasing a little bit, but you know, we're on this trajectory, right? And through each of our actions, as we were talking about, either, either small or large, we are, are building that future, the feminist futures we've been talking about. Um, and, and there's a lot of power and possibility in that, again, even in the, in the small transformations that when we work together cumul cumulatively, um, become something much, much larger. And, um, and I wanna thank you all for, for this discussion and also the consortium again for, for convening us. Thank you so much, Diana. Thank you so much, all of you. That was an incredible panel that's finished an incredible few days. This is a symposium I'll remember for a long time. I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking it's given what's well, given me much food for thought and also much energy for the struggle. So I have a few just final things to say. Um, First of all, for the next 10 minutes, the chat will remain open for people to share resources, maybe respond to questions. Um, so please do make suggestions in the chat for resources, stick around and contribute there. We will compile those resources um, from the audience and the panelists to, to share at the end of the symposium. Secondly, I want to say a huge thank you to all the panelists and moderators over the five panels. It's really been one of the most inspiring, engaging and fun events to be part of. I also want to thank all the people in the audience over the five panels um, who really submitted some challenging and really excellent questions. Um, and without your engagement, it wouldn't have been the same event. So thank you for listening, engaging and submitting your questions. Sorry, we didn't always get to all of them. I also want to thank all the people who worked so hard to put this event together. So that's Carol Cohn, um, director of the consortium, Melissa Kay, um, Katie Rose Parsons, and the whole invaluable team of interns at the consortium who have worked really, really hard to pull this event together. So, you know, thank you to them for, for bringing us all together, um, to forge connections, to share ideas, to criticize constructively, create knowledge, and build energy for the never more necessary than now collective feminist struggle to confront the climate crisis. Thank you all. Bye, thank you all. Bye, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.